Like, it's fun to talk about. And I'm sure Justin Fields would like to actually play in the games. But mm-hmm. still, this is one of your investments for the most important position in all of football at quarterback. There's no way they would actually do this, right? No, they're not going to do this. It's an interesting idea, and I understand why it's an idea. <clears throat> and this was brought about by Steelers special teams coordinator Danny Smith, who used to be here in D.C. He was with the Redskins back in the day, covered Danny for a long time. Very likable guy. He's been around forever. So I think this is just him saying, huh, you know, it's Justin Fields guy. He's super athletic. But you don't want a guy who is your backup quarterback <laughs> returning kicks, especially when Russell Wilson is sort of on thin ice anyway. Like, just imagine if this happened with other teams. Broncos getting ready to receive the kick. Jared Stidham grabs the ball at the 20. Like, you'd be like, what in oh, the hell is no. going on here? Does it have anything to do with the new rules, though? Yes. It's not nearly as that's, dangerous as it is now. That's exactly what it is, which is why they're considering. That's a really good point, which is the defenders who are coming at you can't get started until you receive the football. So the NFL took this rule from the USFL, now the UFL, which is a good rule because they want to prevent those collisions. So the thought is, well, if these defenders are starting from standing still, then they're not running at you. There's a propensity for less damage than we might normally see. So that's a really good point. That's the reason why this is being considered, but it's not going to happen. They also signed Cordero Patterson in the offseason. That's going to be the guy returning kicks. Yeah, a guy who has actually done this. Because even if the rules change, there are still people that are going to be tackling Justin Fields. And he certainly still can get hurt. Like, maybe it's not as bad as somebody rearing up and having 60 yards to build up speed. But still, there are going to be some hard hits on kick returns. Maybe just not as damaging as we are used to seeing. I am going with Orlando. I like the magic. Now, they didn't win game five, but they put up a hell of a fight. They had a chance to win that game late. And I think they send this game back to Cleveland for a game seven. The difference between what we saw from Orlando early in this series and what we're seeing now, it comes down to a couple things. Number one is they play great defense. That's what they're known for. So not the best offensive team, but they can lock you down defensively. And then offensively, we didn't really see this in game six because or in Game 5 because Paulo Boncaro just went nuts, dropped 39 points. But in the game before that in Orlando, the Magic had six players score in double figures, and that is the Magic elixir for Orlando, right? If they can get more balance from their lineup scoring-wise instead of just Boncaro and Wagner, then they have a chance to send this game back to Cleveland. I think they do. And if you look back at the regular season, And we saw this in the playoffs, too. Orlando is a machine at home. 29-13 and against the spread. So I'm going Orlando tonight. I will lay the points. I think it says something when the market is actually favoring the Orlando Magic. Uh, This is not a team that the market loves. Obviously, it's in Orlando. It's not a team that's chock full of superstars. So I think it's saying something when you see the market actually favor the Magic. We saw this all season long when the Magic were favorite. This uh, favorites. This was the time to bet on them. And we're also seeing this line move. Started three and a half. Now we're seeing fours across uh, most places. But as a favorite so far this season, the Magic are a blistering 32 and eight. So I think you read the signs that the market is telling you, and you take the Magic in this one. Next up, let's go to the Clippers and the Mavs. This game in Dallas, where we have the Mavs laying seven and a half, total of 207 and a half, and Dallas leads this game, or series, I should say, three games to two. So the Clippers on the brink of elimination. Jenks, are you on the Mavs again? Yes, well, no. <laughs> Good job. Yes, uh, no. Nailed Here's it. the thing. I, I am on the Mavs, but not at this number, is what I'm trying to say. So I think the Mavs are going to win this game. And I just think this number is too high. And I feel like it's a bit of an overreaction based on what we saw previously last time out where the Mavs just dominated from start to finish. So I'm thinking about maybe, mm, if I'm feeling frisky, maybe I'll put the Mavs money line in a parlay or something have some fun on a Friday. But ultimately, we're still talking about a Clippers team that has Paul George, that has James Harden. They are talented enough to keep this within 
seven and a half points. And also, going back to last game, the reason why I like Dallas on the road is that they were one of the best teams on the road against the number of the season at home. Not so much. Dallas just 22 and 21 against the spread. The only sabotage factor is when you see a line this high, I'm like, am I being fooled here? Is this spread begging me to bet the Clippers when the Mavs are the right side? Like, it seems astronomically high to me. So I need to do a deeper dive into it. But I would lean Clippers. Just feels like for a playoff game for a Clippers team that still has plenty of talent, they can keep this within seven on a hook. The Brewers at plus 110 is a good price because the Brewers can hit. But I mm-hmm. I do like Chicago first five money line at minus 135. Do I want to trust Hayden Wasinski? I think I will. He's been pretty solid this season. Started in the bullpen. Now the Cubbies are trying to work him into the rotation. And he's going up against Joe Ross. And Joe Ross is a good story because he missed all of last season, I believe, undergoing Tommy John surgery. He had some sort of injury. But he was with the Nats. He was out last season. Now he's back. And he's been serviceable. Not great. But good enough, and I, I think when you're talking about the way he's pitched, I don't know if we're going to see any positive regression from him, but you know he's going to get run support. That's the thing with the Brewers is that they can hit the ball, and that's your sabotage factor here. Ultimately, though, I will trust the Cubbies, and this is the third straight day I've made this bet. Cubs first five money line. You can find it at minus 139, so I will take that today at Wrigley. Yeah, I think the sabotage factor with the Brewers today is that Joe Ross has had some really crooked numbers in some of these starts that maybe even a good hitting lineup can't overcome. Gave up seven against the Padres, gave up seven against the Yankees, and the Brewers behind him have only won one of his starts. That is four losses as opposed to one win. Some of those aren't reflected in his record because obviously there are other things that go into it uh, when registering a win or a loss. But still, the run support has not been there for Joe Ross, especially in those starts where he's giving up a ton of runs. Not going to go against the Cubs at home. A day game on a Friday in Chicago. Wrigley should be rocking. I'm going to go with the Cubs with you. I'm going to take them in the full game on the money line, minus 135. Next up, we've got two of the best offenses in all of baseball, squaring off Braves and Dodgers in L.A. Uh, it's a pick em both ways and a total of nine runs. Charlie Morton, the curveballer, gets the ball for Atlanta. He's 2-0 and with a 3-6-0 ERA, squaring off against Gavin Stone, who's 2-1 and with a 4-6-8 ERA. Jenks, two really good teams. What's mm-hmm. the play here? The play is the over. Deciding if I want to make it one of my official plays when we hand out our cards at the end of the show. This is, we're talking about gut plays, right? This is sort of a gut play Mm -hmm. for me. Doesn't this feel like one of those games, like Dodgers and Braves first time this season, warm weather out west, and these guys just outslug each other? Now, every now and then, Charlie Morton will throw a gem. He was great last time out against the Guardians. The Guardians can hit the ball. Seven shutout innings for Charlie Morton last time out. But I just don't know if I see that happening here. Average-wise, these are the number one and the number two teams in the majors. Dodgers, top run scoring team in Major League Baseball. Braves are 12. Both bullpens are excellent. Maybe that's your sabotage factor, but I can't help but think we see a ton of runs cross the plate. And it's used to the over for a reason. Minus 120 to the over. I'm going to go over nine at West. 